Hi there, my name is David Hackett. I'm currently a researcher here at the Armenia Project, and today we'll be presenting some information regarding U.S. foreign policy interests in the South Caucasus. So, when considering how the United States is engaged in the region, it's important to remember that the South Caucasus is something of a frontier zone for U.S. diplomacy. Now, this doesn't mean the United States has never engaged in the region before. In fact, in an unofficial capacity, it has. During the Armenian Genocide, the Near East Relief Program was established by the United States to address uh, casualties that were inflicted on Armenians during the genocide in an unofficial capacity. But officially, diplomatic relations between the United States and Armenia began in 1992, following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The same took place between Azerbaijan and Georgia. So by relative purposes, or in a relative sense, uh, the South Caucasus is something of a new region for U.S. engagement. It is, doesn't have a long and established history in an official sense. So for the last 30 years, the United States has engaged in policies that have to an outside observer seemed ideologically inconsistent among uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Analysts here in Armenia have tried to determine how best to engage the United States without this ideological focus. How do you deal with a party which seems to change decisions left and right. It doesn't seem ideologically focused or aligned with any of the individual powers within the region. So the purpose of this presentation will be to discuss that through something called Congressional Research Service Reports, reports that are circulated within America's legislature that reflect internal and domestic policies on how Congress and the federal government of the United States should approach diplomacy in the South Caucasus. So, the purpose of this presentation is to underpin understanding U.S. foreign policy in the South Caucasus. Now, this is not a comprehensive presentation. The sources of this presentation's information come from something called Congressional Research Service, a organization that un is underpinned by the Library of Congress in, within the United States that was dedicated in the wake of the First World War to un inform U.S. foreign policy and other policy objectives within U.S. Congress. So. It does not constitute an entire understanding of U.S. policy. However, because of its internal nature, given that it is not intended to be circulated outside of Congress, it provides a unique perspective through which to observe U.S. foreign policy, given that this is unvarnished, unedited, and intended for lawmakers, not for the public. So when a few of these reports actually get published for public view, it gives a unique perspective that is internally focused, you're not going to get the same sort of information that you would from an official press briefing from the White House or from Congress when passing an official bill intended for consumption by American citizens and global citizens. It will provide a bit of a unique in insight or expertise into the subject. So how we've, how we've gone about doing this, we've compiled as many uh, reports as possible using particular keywords related to the South Caucasus, namely Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Pashinyan, current administration, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, South Caucasus, Caucasus, and so forth. Now, because only a few of these reports are available to the public, this does not constitute an entire look at U.S. policy, just to reiterate. The important thing to remember is that it provides a lens through which to analyze it. We managed to pull between 25 to 32 reports in this capacity, and having compiled them, there are a few insights that we can discern from CRS that indicate U.S. policy interests in the South Caucasus. And through analyzing those, we can take a look at what consistencies mix between them. How do they stick together? And what can that tell us about U.S. interests within the South Caucasus? So having analyzed these uh, 25 or 32 reports, we found four key points of similarity that co-align co co along these reports, which may be dedicated to issues within the South Caucasus, surrounding the South Caucasus, and adjacent to the South Caucasus, related to potentially countries that are in, within its vicinity have a uh, close relationship. These are the four insights we found. The idea of pacification of the region, according to the United States. The idea of economic integration, with the South Caucasus, all three of its members, or its unrecognized states, the idea of ensuring energy security for U.S. markets, and the idea of challenging great powers that exist within the region. So if we're going to discuss priority number one, the United States appears to have an interest in the pacification of the region itself, given that the South Caucasus is home to several breakaway conflicts, the war in Artsakh, the war in Abkhazia, and the war in South Ossetia. Now, 
When we mention pacification, it's important to recognize that this does not mean settling the conflict in a manner that might inherently benefit Armenian interests. Pacification means ending the conflict, not settling in a favorable manner. This might be because the United States has an interest in the region, not inherently in establishing closer diplomatic links with any of the parties out of an ideological sense, but due to the next couple of interests. So, pacification of conflict is an interest of the United States for a couple of reasons, and that connects to economic integration. Given that the United States has engaged in the South Caucasus for only around 30 years as a direct, in terms of direct engagement following the collapse of the Soviet Union, Remember that it constitutes something of a new market for the U.S. to engage in, whether it be oil and other uh, fossil fuels from Azerbaijan, rare earth minerals from Georgia, and mine access in Armenia. Every state in the South Caucasus has a different, a different product or a different good to export that the United States has an interest in. And as a state in which engagement is limited and relatively novel, the U.S. has an interest in entrenching itself in an economic sense. And that connects to the third uh, priority of the US, energy security. Lying in tandem with economic interests, energy is perhaps the most salient interest of the United States within the South Caucasus. And this explains why, in light of an ideological disalignment with Azerbaijan, the United States has an interest in engaging with Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is not a member of OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. OPEC is designed to uh, limit fossil fuel production or choke it off by its member states and regulate it so that oil markets remain stable. That's the official terminology behind it. Unofficially, it may be used to ratchet up the prices when supply is low to maximize value or otherwise pedal it back if oil demand falls. Azerbaijan not being a member of this alliance makes it a strategic interest to the United States because the U.S. is systematically opposed to what it considers cartel behavior. Whether OPEC actually organizes a cartel is up for individual analysis. Every analyst might give you a different answer. But for American interests, it's what makes Azerbaijan unique to American interest. Because it's not a part of this cartel, if OPEC and the United States clash on a certain price hike, for example, or a policy initiative that's introduced in OPEC, Azerbaijan not following that means that the United States can ensure that its energy supply uh, disruption is limited. That makes it a strategic interest of the states. It's not to imply that Armenia and Georgia have no value to American energy security, but it might serve to explain why, despite Armenia's ideological proximity to the United States, that the U.S. has an interest in doing business with Azerbaijan. And number four, perhaps the most overarching priority of the U.S. and the South Caucasus is power politics. Because the South Caucasus is at a crossroad of several world regions, and because it exists at the threshold of certain large powers, Russia to the north, Turkey to the west, Iran to the south, and the Caspian Sea power, uh, states to the east, it becomes something of a geopolitical in arena through which large powers that lie adjacent to the South Caucasus and superpowers that have an interest in the South Caucasus to do battle. So given that the region is not uniquely dominated by any particular country, given that Turkey, Iran, and Russia, its immediate neighbors, all have some degree of interest within the region, that opens the door for larger powers to also engage in a manner of diplomatic infighting, so to speak. The United States may have interest in the South Caucasus. Canada might. The OECD states might. The European Union might. China might. That engagement in that battle leads to scuffling of sorts within, within the South Caucasus in terms of that diplomatic engagement. So if the United States follows the European Union's example of establishing an office for engagement in Hegnazor, in Vyatzor, that's not only simply setting up shop for, to engage diplomatic relations, that might be placed in, order of, in the hopes of displacing foreign interest. So let's say if the United States decides that it wants to invest in the tech sector here in Armenia or Azeri oil fields, that's not simply just for U.S. economic engagement. It could be to push away interest from Iran and Russia, two states which at this point in time stand anathema to American interests. So when we consider these interests in tandem, they begin to paint something of a consistent policy of U.S. engagement within the South Caucasus that lacks an ideology, but has a rationale behind it. 
So when it comes to understanding what this engagement might mean for Armenia, there are pros and cons to closer integration with the United States. And this sort of perspective is something that is not often observed within Armenian diplomacy, right? Because from an American perspective, there's a sort of moral engagement that's presented with uh, diplomatic engagement with the United States and the Western world at large, given that democratic norms, political freedoms, and other sorts of political liberalism are often presented as the right path by the West. But if we're looking at it in an objective lens, there are positives and negatives for Amer Armenia's closeness with the United States if things were to shift in this manner. If Armenia were to move closer to U.S. engagement and follow U.S. interests, there are some positives. It could mean closer engagement with U.S. economic interests and Western economic interests, which arguably possess a large deal of sway over global economic markets. So accepting U.S. investment, or Western investment for that matter, could place Armenia within supply chains and other forms of engagement that could enhance its soft power or enhance its economic standing within the region, as well as potentially entrench adherence with uh, democratic norms and principles and political liberalism that establishes closer ties to the West. Those may be some of the benefits, and that's not to imply that those are false by any means. However, there also may be other things to consider that closer integration with the United States may stand against Armenian interests. For example, if we were to look at how the power political structure of the South Caucasus and Armenia's perspective is shaped, Armenia's central allies within the region in terms of political or geopolitical engagement are Russia and Iran, two states which, with which the United States stands in, as an ideological en enemy as of 2023. So if the United States engages in the region and tries to push Iranian and Russian interests or influences to the side, that may open up engagement from Turkey and Azerbaijan that stands against Armenia's interests. So for example, if you look at former uh, policy and comments made by the Iranian regime regarding Armenia's security in Sunik, American engagement might not directly impact that uh, border security in Armenia South. But if Russia and Iran are placed off to the side, American interests within the region might serve to benefit Turkish Naziri benefits, which would be uh, to continue to carve away Armenia's sovereignty in the South. It's not to imply that the United States deliberately would stand for that, but the rationale behind why they might make that decision may highlight American interests within the region that are less ideologically focused. So when it comes to understanding this outlook, it can seem a little dichotomous to look at it through a perspective of the United States being a politically liberal country within the international relations framework that also seems to lack an ideology of dealing uh, with the South Caucasus, especially when there's such sharp divides between the political systems that characterize Armenia and Azerbaijan. And a large part of what dictates this lack of consistency and understanding is because from an external perspective, it would seem that the United States and Armenia do share a degree of closeness. There's proximity there. Say, for example, Armenia's dedication to political liberalism or the protection of freedom of speech here, protection of political freedoms and uh, economic principles here in Armenia creates a framework through which the United States and Armenia would seem to make more of a natural pairing in geopolitical terms than Armenia, than, forgive, than Azerbaijan and the United States. And that goes doubly when you consider the interest of the Armenian diaspora within the United States. Approximately 8.7 million Armenians live within the diaspora, compared to the 2.8 to 3 million here in the Republic. And a large subsect of that population, while numbers vary between 500,000 and 2 million, depending on who you ask, live in the United States. And the diaspora contains political power that can be used to sway U.S. interests. So between those sorts of factors that at play here, it seems a little strange to insinuate that the support for uh, Armenia is neither strong nor consistent within the South Caucasus. But there's a reason for that. However, if we look at these policies through these, this lens and observe American interests within the region through those aforementioned interests categorized by the Congressional Research Service, we begin to see a picture that is not inherently ideologically focused. Rather, it highlights the fact that U.S. integration in the region is not inherently pro-Armenian or anti-Armenian. It is zero-sum in nature. If we were to place it in a simple English phrase, it's just good business. That commercial interest or that interest in object furthering U.S. objectives within the region, whether it be conflict pacification, economic engagement, 
energy security and power politics, creates a picture of a policy that is neither pro-Armenian or anti-Armenian. Rather, it just is. So if we observe this policy through a lens of moral engagement, as might be done within the Armenian diaspora or even here in the Republic, it may seem strange to continue doing business with a party that supports you in some elements, yet supports your enemy, your ideological enemy and others. But if you look at it through this zero-sum diplomacy track of simply following business interests within the region, it starts to make a little more sense. If we look at the conflict in Artsakh, for example, the United States would support, theoretically, a peaceful reconciliation of the conflict. That doesn't inherently mean that it supports Artsakh's pol political liberty. Say, for example, if Artsakh were to gain statehood in the South Caucasus and establish itself, the United States, through this theory, would have no problems recognizing it and doing it business with it. It would essentially go as, okay, Artsakh is independent, fantastic. That's another place where the United States can entrench its interests. Whereas if Artsakh were wiped off the map, if the ethnic cleansing in place, currently in place continued to take place and wiped out all of our, the Armenian population living in Artsakh and be, officially became a de jure, or rather a de facto, uh, Azerbaijani province, the United States, of course, would do what the United States does and protest against a crime against humanity and, and a, a crime against the recognition of those populations and the, their political rights. But it wouldn't mean they would inherently stop doing business with Azerbaijan. It's impossible to make any sort of groundbreaking predictions, given that foreign policy interests can change over time. But if we look through this framework, the United States is not acting on an ideological basis. It's acting on one in pursuit of its tangible interests alone. That doesn't make it pro-Armenian or anti-Armenian. It makes it neutral. And navigating that policy is a challenge, but understanding it through this lens may help Armenia have a stronger position at the negotiating table with the United States and other powers of the South Caucasus if observed through this framework. So if we consider this framework, how does Armenia exactly approach the negotiating table with the United States, right? Because observers within the United States and within Armenia may find confusion when trying to deal with the United States by treating it as an ideological ally. Of course, this doesn't imply that there isn't that cultural proximity, right? There's sympathy largely across the United States for Armenia regarding its, the war in Artsakh and the geopolitical context that shaped the South, South Caucasus. It does not mean that there's no support for Armenia, but rather that the government is going to enact on an agenda that is based in tangible interest alone. So with this in mind, how does Armenia exactly deal with Uncle Sam? There's three policies here that, or policy recommendations that can be made to support Armenia's position at the negotiating table to maximize it. The first one is recognizing US interests as zero sum diplomacy. Following that, it's to engage the United States directly with its material interests in mind rather than ideological focus or alliance. And number three is to utilize a resource at Armenia's disposal that could help it navigate this environment, its diaspora. So if we're going to negotiate this from the three, three points, we start off with the idea of recognizing this diplomacy for what it is. Despite the fact that there is support for, the, for Armenia within the United States, among diaspora members or those engaged with human rights that may not even be related to the diaspora, government relations within the South Caucasus constitute a zero-sum track of diplomacy. That means that the United States is going to pursue its material interests in the South Caucasus above all else. So while there is talk that is supportive of Armenia, if Armenia is to approach the negotiator's table, it cannot be on the basis of ideological support. The same way that cultural affinity with France, for example, given its diaspora relationships and the close government relationships that have formed between the French Republic and the Armenian Republic, it does not mean you can rely on that at the negotiator's table. By recognizing U.S. interests as zero sum, Armenian negotiators, both metaphorically and quite literally, can approach with a second context in mind. They must approach the negotiator's table with America's tangible interests in mind. And remember, these interests constitute tangible interests. The idea of energy security, of economic integration, of power politics management, and for its fourth interest, the idea of pacification of conflict to pursue those avenues. If Armenian negotiators approach the negotiator's table with those interests in mind and a willingness to not rely on the United States from a perspective of alliance, that gives a lot more power to Armenian negotiators at the table. And number three, utilizing the diaspora. 
Having spoken with a couple of government figures here within the Republic, I've been told a certain phrase that changed my personal perspective when doing this research, is that in relation to the war in Artsakh and the South Caucasus' geopolitical uh, perspective, Azerbaijan has oil, but Armenia has its diaspora. That doesn't mean inherently relying solely on the diaspora as an arbiter of political influence, but that the Armenian Republic does have a tool through which it can appeal to U.S. interests that don't simply rely on tangible methods of integration. What that means is that instead of approaching the United States government negotiators, metaphorically and literally, with that moral perspective in mind, the Armenian government can approach the diaspora with that sort of engagement, right? Because the diaspora has an ability to engage with the U.S. government in a manner that the Republic cannot. Because so many Armenian diaspora members are voting members within the United States. They're members of the population that can and often do vote together en masse. They form a cohesive voting bloc. And by engaging with that interest, the Armenian Republic can engage the diaspora as an element or rather an arbiter of soft power within the U.S. If the Republic of Armenia engages the diaspora into supporting an issue related to let's say, political security in Artsakh or human rights in Artsakh. If the diaspora is engaged, given its political mobility and its strength as, in, as a diaspora voting bloc, that can place pressure on U.S. government officials. So instead of approaching the negotiator's table with a moral perspective, engage the diaspora because it forms a powerful tool for Armenia and Armenians to have what I would readily consider, consider as allies across the pond. So to conclude this lecture, what we've attempted to do today is to understand the ideological lack of engagement within the South Caucasus by the United States and to understand some of the tangible interests that underpin it. After introducing some of the historical context, both unofficial and official, that have shaped U.S. engagement into the region, we've discussed what the series of reports that underpin this project suggest about U.S. integration within the South Caucasus. How that diplomatic engagement, despite having an ideological uh, void, so to speak, highlights an actual engagement policy within the South Caucasus. It is not a whole endorsement of American interests, but it highlights a particular element of engagement that might not readily become clear in official publications. And that interest relates to tangible policy interests that are pursued in a zero-sum nature by the U.S. government. After engaging with those interests, we now can understand how army negotiators at the table, remember both metaphorically and literally, can approach the United States without this ideological lens in mind. And it, with this in mind, it can help Armenia maximize its position at the bargaining table and ensure that its interests are met in an arena, both metaphysical and literal, in which it must fight to pursue its interests. So this doesn't mean the United States and Armenia don't have a strong relationship or that Armenia can't have a strong relationship with the United States. But rather, going forward, if there's any policy recommendation to take away from this beyond the, your own, it would be that Armenia needs to approach the United States as an equal within the region. As an ally, yes, but not solely through that allied lens. By engaging in a manner that is more recognizant or cognizant of the zero-sum diplomacy that categorizes U.S. engagement, Armenia can maximize its benefits at the table when engaging the United States and, with any luck, ensure that its interests are met across the board, increasing its strength at the table and ensuring positive outcomes for Armenians, both within the South Caucasus and beyond.